Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, let's get started. So um, this is the second part of our Open Data for Open Science session. Um, we're going to start this one with a presentation on OData. Over the last couple of days, you have heard a lot about this data protocol that helps Microsoft to solve our own data interoperability problems. And we're hoping that this would be introduced to the academia community and help them perhaps advance a little bit with their data issues. And Chris is from our data. So my name is Chris Robinson, um, at, and I work at Microsoft. Uh, I've worked there for the last four years on the open data protocol. And prior to that, I worked on some other data access technologies in the Microsoft stack. So um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the talk. We're just going to go over sort of a, a highlights of the OData protocol. And then we'll go over sort of consuming it and producing an OData feed, and then wrap up in a Q&A. So, uh, what is OData? And um, you know, there's there's so many places where we have data in the world today. You know, it could be in a lot of different uh, containers. It could be in a file. It could be in a database. It could be some repository somewhere. Um, and you know, we need to transfer data between uh, where it is and somewhere else to some other computer on the internet. And um, so, what Microsoft has done is we've sort of Put, uh, conceptually, we put an OData service over the top of that data. And then um, what we do is we just use, we just transfer the data over HTTP. So it's just um, normal interactions. And then, of course, it can go against multiple you know, types of devices. So it can go to a mobile device or tablets and laptops and other machines and, um, and other platforms as well. And and uh, so what we, one of the pieces that we sort of added to this, this OData service is, is metadata. And it's, it's just the, the structure of, of the data that's in the service. So um, an example would be, you know, if you look at customers, you could tell the structure of the customer. The customer has a first name. It has a last name. It has something that identifies um, the uniqueness of a, of a customer as well. And, and um, we can transfer the data of a resource via JSON or Atom. And JSON is just JavaScript object notation. And um, Atom is you know, what people read in their blogs and RSS. So uh, all of the semantics are built on top of um, HTTP. So like uh, we had previous demos that, or previous talk where people sort of had similar things. And um, if we look at start at the top there, if I the, uh, the sample I have here, and I'll, I'll go into more detail afterwards, is I'm just querying data from a service that returns periodic table of elements. So in this first query, I'm just getting the hydrogen element. And you know the symbol is essentially the key. And then if I want to post a new element, I would just post it with the payload, which would be Atom or RSS, to elements, and it would just be added. And if I wanted to delete, I could just delete the element with the with the name. So that's how I would reference it. And then if I want to update it, I would just do an update. Um, so we've, in OData, we built some query conventions to be able to, uh, to be able to find the data in interesting ways. And some of the examples that I already gave are ways that you can access an, an individual resource via URI. And this is a little bit more complex. Um, all this is saying is that I want to get a hydrogen, and then I want to get all the compounds of hydrogen. And so it's just a relationship. Um, oops, uh, but we could do additional queries that are a little bit more complex as well. We have some conventions. Like in this case, I want to get all of the elements that are a noble gas. So I can use this dollar filter syntax and then say you know, the type equals noble gas. And it can be more complex than that. So you know, from what what I've sort of talked about here, it builds on HTTP and the standard verbs. So 
it, you know, get, put, post, delete. It uses the normal status code. So, you know, if you do a request, it's just going to give you that doesn't return content. It's just going to return no content. Or if it's a bad request, it's just going to say a bad request. Or if you form the URI incorrect in, in the wrong way, then you'll just get something that'll say maybe a 405 method not allowed kind of thing. Um, so, you know, like the web, like when you, when you go onto the web and you, and you put in a website or some URL and you get the wrong thing, you know, this is very much like that. Um, so also we use standard HTTP headers, um, you know, the content type and the accept headers. So if I want to get JSON, I would just say I'm, I'm accepting the JSON, uh, JSON app, application JSON. And, you know, we could also use e tags as well. Um, and uh, I've already discussed sort of standard formats that we use and just normal interactions over HTTP. Um, and what we're adding on top is we're just adding this sort of way to query the data. And we're adding metadata to understand what the structure of the data is. So, um, so why would you want to use OData? Um, so it, at the beginning there, I had a diagram and I just had a store of data. And the idea is, is you just want to abstract away what the data is actually stored in so that you can focus on, on just accessing the data alone and not worrying about the complexities of how it's stored or what format it's stored in. And um, you, know, you could use uniform patterns to go and access these things. You, you could think about um, 10 years ago, they came up with uh, SOAP implementations to be able to exchange information. And typically, people would make APIs like get customers, just to get your customers. And then get customers, get related orders of customer. And you would you know, implement all of these different methods. And now you don't have to implement these methods. You would just use sort of REST calls to be able to get them in a, in a standard conventional way. Um, oh, just let me uh, go back there. So what I'm going to go, what I'm going to show you is, uh, I'll just show you a demo of an OData service. And I'm just using the periodic table of elements here. So I, all this is is the, the root page of the service. And it just shows. Um, the compounds and the elements. So these are just the sets that things are in. And you know, if I want to go to uh, the compounds, I would just take type compounds. And I want to type that. And so then it's just going to return me a feed. And so you can see at the top right up here, it says feed, and then it has an entry. And um, then we have the, the, the actual structural information in here. So I could get the. In this case, I just made something very simple just to show relationships. Um, but uh, we have the formula of H2O here. Um, but we could do a little bit more than that. I mean, so like I showed you before, we could drill into and say, I just want to get you know, a single compound. So I just put in the key for it. In this case, I made a fake key that's just sort of an identifier. And then it just returns that information. Um, and then if I want to get, if I want to drill in a little more and just get just the formula, I could just type formula. If I can remember the spelling of formula. And then it will just give me the formula. And this kind of has some, I don't know, uh, XML goo around it. And maybe when I'm, when I'm dereferencing the link, if I'm giving the URI into something, I want to use that link somewhere else. I don't want all of that information. Um, so I, we have a convention here that's called dollar value. And we could just get the value directly. Now this is, I, I should have actually shown a more interesting example here. Uh, a more interesting example would have been, been a photo. If I just had a byte array here. And the reason why it would have been more interesting is because it would have just shown a photo if the mime type was a JPEG. Um, no. Um, so, so uh, there's so you know we we can see that we could drill into properties and such, and we could also drill into relationships. So you'll notice up here, um, actually right here, we have a link to the compounds, and it's just I'm sorry, not compounds. I meant elements because we're in a compound um, right here, and it just says the the link is an href compounds one slash elements. Now, um, so. 
in this case, we could just say elements. And then from there, it's going to navigate to the elements that make up water. So in this case, as you can see, this is hydrogen and uh, this is oxygen. So we can get the relationships within these things. And then um, you, know, you could further sort of, sort of drill in. So these are the URIs, the convention URIs that we can use for accessing particular types of data and drilling into anything in the survey. Um, so let's see, let me show you some other examples as well. So one of the things that I talked about is um, if we go to elements, and you know, I, I might want to do some more um, sophisticated queries here, and it's kind of showing some of the stuff that I've already done. Uh, I'll, I'll use this. Um, so at the top, it says dollar filter. So I already sort of explained what that is. So I'm just finding all the elements that are in uh, the group greater than five. Um, so that's just sort of, if, we, if you could imagine the, the periodic table of elements, there's, uh, I think there's seven, seven groups, and they go down the, tr down the chart. So this is five and down. And so then what I'm doing is I just want to order them in descending order because I'm just trying to show that it's the reverse order, just sort of Z on back. And then I also want to include in the payload the count. I want to know how many, how many uh, elements in this formula that I have. So to do that, and you know, we'll notice that right here, it just has the count. So the, the dollar inline count is just another convention that we have that we can use for querying. And, um, and then it gives all of the entries. And you'll notice that like zinc is on top because we ordered it in a descending manner. So uh, this is sort of the, and, and uh, just to kind of talk about this a little bit more, um, we have metadata in here that sort of describes the specific properties itself. So this is a single or an in 16 or uh, that kind of thing. So you know a little bit more about it. So we've kind of attributed additional metadata into the payload as well. Um, and this is helpful for uh, just serialization and deserialization, writing parsers and deserializers and such, and, um, having, having all the information you need to. So that's, that's just a very quick overview of the OData protocol. And uh, for more information, you could just go to www.odata.org or come to me afterwards, and I can tell you about all of the other um, services that this thing allows. Um, but I want to get into, excuse me, I want to get back to the presentation here um, and kind of go into more of a sample that I, that I was doing that I wanted to come up with here. So I, um, I'm a runner, and I have some, some data from 2010 when I was running a lot. And uh, it's just really simple data. It just has the date that I ran on and the calories burned and the distance I ran and the time that it took. And, uh, and I, I, I sort of made some fake calorie data. Now, but in the, in the real world, you could imagine two separate sites, you know, like a fitness site like Garmin that stores your running information and some other nutrition site, I, I don't know, Weight Watchers or something else that has the other data. And, you know, if they expose with uh, feeds, we can go and do data analysis fairly quickly. So that's the sample that I'm going to show you. And you know, the idea here is that we could take unconnected data sets um, that have, that have some, um, something that we can combine them on, and we can kind of do some, some analysis, some interesting analysis. So that's uh, what I'm going to show. Um, so I'm just opening up Excel. I, I'm sure a number of people use Excel for data analysis. And uh, there's a tool for Excel. It's called Power Pivot. And um, it allows you to just import data. Uh, actually, it's more like linking to data. And you, know, you can see you have various options of where you could pull the data from. You could pull it from a database, reports. There's also, Microsoft has something called the Azure Data Market. Um, I'm gonna, I'll talk about it a little bit more. But all I really want to pull from is from the feed here. And the feed, I'm just, I have my, I have my feeds already. I have, they're, two separate feeds, they're not related to each other. There's calorie data and the running data. So I'm going to bring these in and, um, oh, okay, can't actually. So I tried to make this bigger so that everyone could see the URI and then I kind of uh, 
locked myself out of the next button here, so we'll do that. So one of, the, one of the things here is I'm bringing down all of the data, but when you're doing data analysis, especially over larger sets, you might not want to bring over all of the data, which is why the query capabilities are, are really nice to have. So in this case, I'm bringing, I'm bringing it all down, but you could, instead of putting in the full, the full data, you could just put in just a filter statement that brings down just the pieces that you need. And so in this data set here, it, it sort of uh, it shows up, and it's the date that it occurred on and the amount of calories that were consumed. Um, so we still need to go and bring in the other piece of data. And we'll just go to the feed and bring in the running data. And click Next, Finish. And so now we have the information, but, we, but what we haven't set up is the relationship that, uh, of how we can connect them. So we'll notice in the, in the uh, running data here, we have the date that it occurred on, and then this is sort of the miles I ran, elevation, calories burned, the duration in seconds. Now, the, so we can obviously connect it on the date and the date that it occurred on. So we can add a relationship in here. Um, in the design and just create that. We have the running entries, the date occurred, and then the calorie entries and um, the date. So we'll just create that. So that creates the relationship. But um, so now I kind of, so let me explain a little bit more what I was, uh, the report I was driving at. I just want to give a monthly report of my, of my calorie balance. Like on a month to month basis, am I eating too much? Or am I exercising a lot? Or should I be eating more? So I just want to get that information. So at the end, I want to make a graph that just shows sort of a plus or minus on, on where I'm at kind of thing. And um, so in, in, one, in one set of the data, I could have multiple runs in a day or multiple exercises. So I need to aggregate that information so that I can, um, so that I could do this. So, so uh, I'm going to move to the calorie data, and I'm just going to use uh, right down here is where we can deal with summing and aggregations. So I could just do sum, and then can go to the running entries, and I'll see the calories burned, and I will just do that. And so that that's all I need to do to make an aggregate for it. And I'm just going to call it sum of calories burned. And so that makes the that makes that. And now the other thing I want to do is I, in my report, I want to group by the month. So I'm just going to make a, a calculated column in here that will make the month for each of the dates. So I could just do that by using some Excel logic here. Um, year, date, month, date, and put the parentheses one. And so now I have this new calculated column that I'm just going to call month. Oh, geez, did I delete that? So that was quick. Um, let me let me try that again. Okay. So all I want to do is just let me let me rename, not delete. Okay, so now we've renamed that. And now the last thing that I want to do is I, I actually want to get the balance. So I need to do the math to do that. So I'll just make one more, one more calculation, and then we can do some visualization of the data. And uh, so I just want to take my calories consumed, and I want to subtract it from. And um, we could do something a lot more complex here, but uh, you know everyone has a base metabolic rate of how many calories they consume in a day kind of thing. So I'm just putting 1750 because I used some website to calculate what mine was. And um, then what I'm going to do is just add that with the aggregation that I have. Um, calories and sum of calories burned. And so now we have, on a daily basis, we have the account. And so now let's actually, let's, let's kind of visualize the data. And I'm just going to use a pivot, pivot viewer here, and we'll kind of, um, oh, this, is, this is really small. So I'm just going to get the account, and then I'm going to get the month, 
and the sum of the calories burned. And so now I have the chart, but I now I have a pivot chart of the data that I want, but I, I just want to I just want to make a chart of it or uh, I just want to make some kind of visual representation of it. So I will just make a graph here. And so you know so this is fairly quick. I'm just taking two different feeds for people who are just coming in. I'm taking two different <laughs> no worries. Yeah, oh, is that what it, okay. Uh, so I'm just taking two independent OData feeds, and I'm just sort of mashing them up to do some analysis. And the analysis here is just on um, the on the data that I have, and um, I have some running data that has my calories burned, and the and also the uh, the calorie data data on a day-to-day -day basis. So you can see that in the winter months I'm not running, and I'm I'm e I'm eating more. And uh, in the other times, when I'm running more, my the amount of the balance of the calories is generally better. So, you know, these are the kind of things that you could do when you have the data in a format that is that is easy. Like I, I'm just visualizing it in Excel. Now there's other tools for that as well. Um, I don't know if people have heard of Tableau. It's sort of a startup for data analysis and they also work on feeds as well. Um, so you know you're you don't you're not restricted to one set of data visual and visualization software. You can use them in other places. So that's, um, so that's sort of an overview of consuming OData feeds. And um, now I'm just going to go and talk about producing OData feeds. And I'm not going to go into a demo. It's more of just talking about it. Now, Microsoft, we have an implementation of a server that produces this. It's called WCF Data Services. That's what I've been working on for four years. And, um, you know, Typically, the, the easiest way for, for that to produce data is, is you know, data from SQL Server and sort of rolling through a simple, uh, a simple set of, uh, of um, using, using Visual Studio to produce it. Um, but uh, this server, the server software itself, if you want to, you can also build a, a provider. And it, what happens is when I was, when I was, um, when I was, uh, showing you the URIs themselves, like elements H or something like that. What we do in our server is we build the query expression. And then we take that query expression and we push it down to the provider. So the provider can then go and, um, you know, if, if, if it was something like Sparkle, you would build a Sparkle query or something like that. Uh, or if it was, in the case of SQL Server, it's going to build T-SQL. Or um, if it was, uh, if it was Oracle, it would build like some uh, the Oracle SQL, and and then from there, then we can pull the data. And the it's fairly simple for someone to build a service if they already have the data in a in a database of some type. Um, then we also have tools on Azure. There's a recently released uh, tool on Azure Labs that allows people to bring in data into um, SQL Azure, and it's a sort of an import tool where you could take CSVs and other files and import it in. And then it's fairly simple to put a data service over the top um, as well. So, um, you know, sort of the conclusion is the, the OData, um, OData increases the accessibility and the consumability of the data. I mean, um, you can, it's moving from a paradigm, you know, previously where we would have database connections and files to the web, where you have a URL that you can access things. And you can, from, from one single uh, service, you can access all of the data that's in that service via all of, the in, all of the unique pieces of data via the URL itself. And it's fairly easy to consume on standard formats. And we could do mashups with the tools that we have of unconnected data sources. And you know, Microsoft is, we have a, a growing ecosystem of tools that we're making and then other people are making some as well. Um, you know, some of the stuff that I showed you is Excel with Power Pivot. And uh, we also have a tool called Data Explorer. And what that does is it's really about taking two independent feeds and then mashing them up in some way and then publishing the mashup in the feed somewhere else so that people could then go and take that and, and uh, use that somewhere. So, I think an example would be, um, it seems like one of the major things that people do are sort of data quality. And, you know, uh, with the mashups with Data Explorer, you could transform the data and, 
you could add a column for if a data equals a certain thing or do some kind of summarization or something like that. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about for data market is um, in, my, in my sample here, I just used just the data that I had, but you could imagine something like weather data. And the data market contains weather data. So it would have been nice to grab the weather data from Azure and then go and see if I like to run in the rain or not. Like there's probably a correlation there. And I, you know, I can get new information and I can ask new questions from being able to access um, data on, a, on, on the data market. And you know, we support a lot of different client and server libraries. We have support for JavaScript, Android, iOS, Windows Phone 7. Uh, there's also open source community project called OData4J. It's, uh, it's, just, it's for a server and, and client libraries to produce OData as well. And um, here's some other useful links and references. Uh, odata.org is the primary place I would just say for people to go. For sort of, if people want to learn about more of the developer side on what WCF data services is, that's first link and power pivot and then tutorials on creating them. And we also have open source Odata projects. These are ones that we've put up. Uh, we have one for Data.js that's just sort of an integration with JavaScript. And we have another thing called the Odata library. And we, we went and built, um, it was originally called Project Astoria or, or the Odata team. And we didn't really uh, separate the, the formatting, the serialization and deserialization. So we've gone back and done that. And we've relate, released that library to the web. So people can use that to build services if they want to. And then we also have an Odata service validation tool. So you know, if you're going to build your own server and you want to be able to interop with interact with all the tools and the ecosystem that's there, you can use these, these uh, service validation tools to validate that what you're producing makes sense and, and will work with, the, work with the larger ecosystem. And so now I'm going to go to Q&A. Um, right. So the way that uh, the three of us, if you were here this morning, and you probably were very impressed by Brian's presentation using Pivot Viewer to uh, visualize the data sets. The three of us, the, the way that we worked is I gave them two data sets. If it didn't work out, it's all my fault. So <laughs> periodic table, it, it's kind of meant to build a very simple demo. And then I also gave them FDA, FDA's food and nutrition facts, which is 55,000 data points. And Brian did a wonderful job of visualize that in a way and then tell the story. The visualization is all about how you take the data and tell the story. So I, I thought that was wonderful. Um, some of you expressed interest that uh, you wanted to give us the data and then do a quick try with all these tools together. And um, yeah, we can do that tonight or tomorrow if you're still around. So um, any questions from the audience? Um, hi, uh, thanks for a very good presentation. I have a question. So, so far you were actually talking mostly about how you uh, aggregate the data. So you essentially have read operation. Sure. Uh, what about modifications? I mean, uh, who is handling them? The notifications? Uh, modifications, like or if modification. I want to delete or modify certain data. Well, I mean, so you could just, uh, when you do the put, you would give it the payload um, for, for yes, the Yes, but uh, if uh, there is a consumer, uh, sorry, producer of the uh, OData data, Sure. There should be some link uh, how to actually delete the data, no? So, so that was actually, um, let me go to the feed itself. Uh, and so one of the things is the example that I'm showing here is based on our, our currently released bits. And we have new, we have new, um, we have new things that are released. And, you know, the, for instance, right here we have um, the link or the edit rel. So there is a there is a link to the the href that you would use to go and do a put to. If the, is that what you're kind of looking uh, not for? Not quite. No? I mean, I understand that you can do put on the kind of HTTP level, but the data that you um, uh, use for producing the uh, output uh, oh, okay. in O data format. Yeah. Is it also going to be modified uh, when you issue a put or delete command? 
okay, through so OD, me, the protocol. Let me ask a clear, clarifying question. Are yeah. you asking um, if we actually will change the data in the underlying store? Exactly. So um, in, our, in our implementation, we have an interface that's an updatable interface. Mm -hmm. And if they decide to implement that, then it would be allowed. Otherwise, it would give like a bad request. So yes, it would, it would definitely update the, the, um, the data. It should. If, and if it didn't, that would be a protocol violation. Is that, did I answer your question? Or uh, I don't know. Maybe. I think so. Because I, basically, my question was, if you have an SQL database that yeah. is used for producing the results, Yep. At some point of time, if you do delete or modification, you need to issue SQL requests, right? Yes. And uh, if the protocol requires you to do that, then yeah, that's a yeah, good yeah, answer. It, it, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We'll Thanks. Update the data. Now, when you build a data sets, you choose what data sets you expose as read only or read and write. Yeah, there's access. So what's the same idea? Actually, when you train all the elements behind it, when you build it, um, you already set the attribute the accessibility on each entry. Do you have a plan for the semantic calculations that has been given by the Tony this morning? As uh, even in case of each property, there might be many conditions to derive such kind of values. And each met each metadata or a meta language may have some semantics behind. Sure. And how do you have a plan to manipulate? So, so I don't think so. I don't think we completely have a plan for all of that. But um, in in our implementation in the in our new bits that will be released in February, we're adding we're adding a way to, for people to attribute the the metadata itself. So. If you want to add additional semantics on there that people need to know about, then you could add it in that place. Um, does that? Yeah, I think. Uh, well, there's a lot. There's a lot there. There's also like the communities that are creating the the metadata for yeah. people to be able to share. Yeah. Some meta knowledge or something. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about uh, the underneath technology that uh, actually collects data and process data and presents data to users. So, basically, using wireless sense network. Okay. So in the last few days and in the few months, you have heard uh, these comments here that uh, it's actually very expensive to move data around. And uh, usually data uh, naturally lives in multiple places where you want to collect them. And uh, another fact is that the computational power that we are getting now is more and more cheaper and faster than the network bandwidth that's available mainly considering, for instance, wireless networks. So it's very, uh, it's much cheaper to compute where the data is instead of moving and sending this data uh, to different places. When you talk about the sensing technologies, there are all sorts of sensing technologies that we can use, for instance, for air, space, and even for uh, getting more information about other planets like Mars, Jupiter, Pluto, etc. But we also have technologies for getting data for, from some elements that are uh, on the surface of the planet uh, and even uh, underwater. So right now you have this technology. It's available and you can make use of that. When you consider the sense technology, for instance, there is a broad uh, spectrum of them with different capabilities and abilities, for instance. If you consider it in one extreme, you have satellites that are very powerful in terms of sense capabilities and communication interface. But on the other extreme, for instance, we have these RFID tags that uh, are very small and cheap, 
but they are very restricted in sensing, in their sensing capability and communication interfaces. And in practice, you can uh, use all sorts of these technologies. In particular, if you consider sensor networks, in the last decade or so, we have lots of research in the computer science community. Okay. So, uh, if you look at the current trends after more than one decade of research in wireless sense networks, there are clear two trends. The first one is the integration of the sense technology to mobile devices like smartphones. So, currently you have smartphones that have like uh, a GPS, uh, accelerometer, you can have a humid uh, pressure sensor. So there is no reason uh, for not uh, uh, introducing this kind of sense technology to, to, to these, uh, to these uh, mobi mobile devices. And we also have uh, several deployment of sensor networks. So what we are uh, seeing nowadays is that you are going to have pervasive computing and pervasive sensing out of those two technologies. Well, another reason to uh, process the data inside the network is that the connectivity is not always available. For instance, uh, after the Katrina hurricane, if you go there to New Orleans, for instance, you didn't have the communication uh, infrastructure available to perform uh, the communication to the outside world, for instance. So you have to rely the mainly on the computation inside the network and ad hoc communication. Sometimes you don't uh, have the uh, physical resources to send the communication. So, for instance, if you are running out of battery, so you don't want to uh, send uh, uh, information that's not very useful for you. So you want to retain that, uh, that computation inside the network. And sometimes uh, you got intermittent communication. And this was the case, for instance, in the 9-11. Uh, at least, at least 300 firefighters died because they didn't get the message to evacuate the buildings. Okay, so it means that uh, for some reason, probably there were lots of communication going on at that moment, and that message couldn't go through those noise environment, and they didn't receive this message. For there is another reason for uh, for not uh, sending. Uh, a message, for instance, for security, so you don't want to stay, to stay quiet, so your enemy doesn't want to, to know that you are there, or you, want, you don't want the, your enemy you are there. And depending on the application requirements. So for different reasons, uh, you more probably you not communicate all the time. Okay, so it's also cheaper to compute uh, uh, where the data is instead of moving because of the economics. And economics dictate uh, the scale out, uh, the scale out, not the scale up. So uh, it's very important to understand this fact. And uh, in particular in the area of computer science, uh, there are lots of lots of opportunities, research opportunities uh, regarding all these aspects. So there are some principles that we should consider. The first one uh, is that uh, to scale uh, distributed system design, we should focus on data, not just the computation. And we also should respect the laws of physics. For instance, we have some restrictions regarding the latency and bandwidth. Okay. And uh, this has been testified in different ways. Uh, the March 2006, the Nature Issue, uh, was devoted mainly to this problem of the future computing and the huge amount of data that you are going to have in the years ahead and how you should uh, deal with them. Okay, so this was the issue. 
And regarding the applications for this uh, sensor network, there are lots of them in different domains. For instance, uh, one of the probably one of the first real world uh, ex experiments using moats was the experiment uh, performing the Great Duck Island uh, in the east coast of the United States, where uh, moats <coughs> were deployed there. And the biologists start monitoring these storm petrels. And uh, the main result for this kind of deployment is that the biologists acquire new knowledge about uh, the behavior of these birds. And these birds, or the knowledge they had at that time, were different from uh, the, the kind of knowledge they used to have because in practice, when you have uh, uh, a biologist uh, just uh, monitoring a given species, you have what you call the probe effect. It means that uh, somehow you are interfering with that uh, experiment in the <coughs> sense that you are interfering with the behavior of the, of the petrol, the storm petrol in this case. So uh, using this kind of technology, uh, somehow you avoid this probe effect. If you look at the Brazilian case, for instance, just to, uh, to let you know, in Brazil we have like uh, between 10 and 20 percent of all world uh, known species. Uh, we have a high diversity uh, degree of uh, species there, for instance, uh, uh, Brazil is the number one in mammals, freshwater fish, and flora. We are number two in amphibians, third in birds, and fifth in reptiles. And we are among the top five countries with the highest number of endemic species. It means the species that uh, only occur in, the, in, the Brazi in Brazil. Okay. So uh, there are lots of opportunities for monitoring this kind of species there. So and you don't have uh, uh, probably just a small knowledge uh, about those species. Uh, it's here, uh, Belo Horizonte. Okay, São Paulo is here, Rio is here. Okay, yeah. So just some comments about applications. It's clear that the sense technology will play a very fundamental role for these applications. And definitely, these networks will leverage the tons of sensor data that can be acquired. And the idea here that these sensor networks will extend our capability and ability to interact with the physical world. And by physical world, we mean entities, people, process, etc. Again, we have two clear trends, pervasive computing, and uh, in this case, uh, uh, a very interesting aspect is the citizen science. I'll talk about this a little bit later. And the pervasive sensing, where you have many practical problems and many research problems uh, to solve. Just to give you an idea of how the sensor network uh, works, for instance, uh, you have like uh, uh, rainforest and you want to monitor it. So you can deploy sensors in different uh, heights of the forest to uh, get different kind of data. There are different worlds, uh, depending on the, on the height you are looking at here. So you have an application, and you have this sensor network, and this you have a moat with this hardware capability, and you have a uh, some variables that you want to measure. And uh, somehow you are sending this data to a gateway that uh, will send this information to uh, the internet, for instance, where you can send commands and queries inside the network. And you also can make use of other sources, depending on the kind of application you have, like satellites, etc. And you can combine all these different sources to gain new knowledge about uh, this application. Okay. So if you look at this, this moat, 
it's a typical hardware. It's a computing device that has an energy uh, source, which is has some limitations. Uh, you have a sensing device uh, that will capture these variables that you want to measure. You have uh, uh, a processing unit with memory and a microprocessor, which is typically a low-end processor, that will run algorithms that are related to your application. And you also have a, a real-time kernel to support those applications. And typically, you have a radio to perform this communication. Okay. So uh, what I'll show you now is just uh, some technical questions that come up when you are designing this kind of network. So the first one is, what kind of application you want to monitor here? And uh, because, uh, for instance, you can start uh, saying, OK, I am going to monitor an indoor, indoor application, an outdoor application. So depending on the kind of uh, application you are going to monitor, uh, naturally, you deal with different requirements. Okay. And uh, another interesting question is, is there any access restriction to this monitoring area, or you are free to go there? Depending on the kind of access to this area, you have to design your solution different way. How is going to be the node deployment there? Will it be a random deployment or a deterministic deployment? This will, this will affect the kind of algorithms you are going to run inside this network. So what's the kind of behavior of the value of the variable that you are, we are going to monitor? For instance, you have a very punctual event that you want to monitor, or it's an increasing event that you are going to monitor, or even some mobile uh, event that you are going to monitor. You want to have a monitoring solution that is 24 by 7, or is just for some period of the day. For instance, uh, uh, if we're going to monitor frogs, there are frogs that behave or they sing during the day, and the other frogs, they sing only the night. So it doesn't make sense to monitor this particular frog uh, during all day. Okay. So what's the type of data you are going to collect? So it's just numerical values, alphanumerical values, it's an audio, it's a video, it's an image, or it's a video. So depending on the kind of data you are going to collect, you have to, to have a, a hardware that will be able to support this kind of uh, data. How is going to be the data sampling? For instance, you have continuous data sampling, and this is typically what happens nowadays. So most of, probably, most of the sensor networks we have are designed for continuous data sampling in the sense that you are, uh, along the time, sending periodical data. But you can have an event-driven network. And this is more, uh, much more interesting because, in this case, uh, whenever a particular event happens, you notify this outside entity. You can also send a query inside the network, and the network will answer this query for you. Okay, so that's a different approach. And you can also establish a condition. And given this condition, uh, once this condition is true, you send an uh, answer to the outside entity. So depending, again, on the kind of data you are collecting, you have different solutions. You can also consider static uh, nodes or even mobile nodes. So you can uh, think that uh, uh, you can even use, for instance, your smartphone to collect data in a given scenario, for instance. Okay. So is there going to be any cooperation among the nodes? And this is a very fundamental question, because uh, 
you can gain new knowledge uh, from this data that can be aggregated and uh, uh, you can send uh, uh, this particular information. And this is, of course, very uh, dependent on the application. So how about the data reliability? Data can be lost. Data can be duplicated. Data can arrive out of order or corrupted. They can have different latents. So how do you deal with these uh, aspects of data? So what's the expected uh, data fidelity along the time? Can be constant, can deteriorate. So what other functions can be deployed along uh, your solution, routing, localization, aggregation, synchronization? What, ki of, uh, what kind of nodes you are going to have? Homogeneous, heterogeneous? How is going to be the network organization? A flat, hierarchical? How many nodes? What algorithms are needed by the application? For instance, data mining, machine learning, and uh, probably these two kinds of algorithms will play a very fundamental problem in data processing here. So the network design deals with many questions here. Each one of them allows different possibilities. This leads to different network models and the corresponding algorithms. And this is a fundamental problem in data processing of this kind of network. So what to do? Well, the answer is very simple. What you have to do is to propose the theory that supports this, ki this kind of problem. And given this theory, we will have techniques that will be lead to, the, to a new methodology that we inc uh, can implement in tools. Well, this is very difficult to achieve because uh, to propose a new theory that to start solving this problem right away, uh, it's not the way it works in practice. And the pragmatic answer is very is different. You actually propose incremental advances. So, uh, I'll just give you some examples here about the, the possible use of these sensor networks and data processing. Suppose you want to design a sensor network to monitor cheetahs and warthogs in Africa, for instance. Well, uh, the cheetah is the fast, uh, fastest, fastest moving animal in the world. Okay, So there is no other animal that runs faster than the cheetah. And what happens is that uh, one of the uh, favorite cheetah's food is the warthog. And what happens is that uh, when the uh, cheetah spots this warthog, well, basically, you have, uh, you have lunch or dinner, or he, he, he'll have lunch or dinner, because he runs so fast that he'll catch this animal. OK. OK. But uh, well, what happens here? An expected event happened. This is real. This happened last week. OK. Yes, a British uh, photographer just took these photos. And these are on the web. OK. So what happened is that this warthog, when he notes that he was being pursued by this cheetah, he did us. A uh, U turn and start running after the cheetah. Okay, you see here? And uh, <laughs> what happened is that this, well, I guess the cheetah was so <laughs> scared that uh, he started running away. <laughs> okay, so this happened. And, uh, and this warthog went away. Okay, and uh, he was not food for this animal. Okay. 
So the question is, could you anticipate this event? Uh, I guess no, no one in a, in a good peace of mind would say that this would happen. And uh, of course, uh, uh, not anticipated events can happen and what to do. Uh, so you need to design algorithms that you will learn from this kind of application. Another example, it's very interesting. It's a biological sensor. Uh, actually, uh, like last week or two weeks ago, uh, some British scientists published that uh, there was an earthquake in Italy, in the L'Aquila Lake in northern Italy in 2009. And uh, what's well known is that some animals can predict uh, uh, some uh, natural events like earthquakes. And in the case of these frogs, uh, what happened is that uh, three days before the earthquake happened in that region, they start leaving their area where they live. And uh, uh, so it's very difficult to have sensor technology there to predict an earthquake. But you have the sense of technology to monitor frogs, OK? So you can't monitor frogs that you monitor other events difficult to predict, OK? So uh, you can use this biological sensor to understand what might happen in some, uh, in some, in, in some cases. So again, this is a great opportunity to gain new knowledge. And the third and final uh, uh, example I'll give you is the uh, wildfires that uh, happened in Southern California in 2007. There were a series of wildfires there that began burning across there. And at least uh, 1,500 homes were destroyed and over 500,000 acres of land burned from Santa Barbara to US Mexico border. Nine people died. And the uh, ranging fire was visible from, from space. So you could uh, uh, watch the, these wildfires there. So, uh, so these are two photos from the region of San Diego with lots of smoke there. So a typical question here is, what does it mean to localize and track CO2? What does it mean to localize and track fire, wind, and other uh, physical events? So this is the kind of uh, uh, sensing technology that will probably be very useful in pervasive computing combined with sensing capabilities, for instance, for citizen science. In a situation like this one that happens in Southern California, if you have like a smartphone with a sensor that measures the concentration of CO2, you can know, you can have a map of the distribution of CO2 along this area. And based on that, uh, you can avoid or go to different, to different areas. So this of kind of uh, solution we have. So we have here different technologies to consider. For instance, uh, uh, we've heard about uh, Azure that allows uh, to see an essential network as a database. Actually, you can use the Kinet as a sensing device uh, to get uh, new knowledge. It's very useful. You have to rely on standards for data protocols. We can use cloud computing and sensing devices. Actually, yesterday was announced uh, by ACM a web seminar with some scientists from uh, Microsoft Research talking about uh, uh, cloud computing with smart devices. So it would be interesting to watch that. And uh, uh, a very powerful uh, tool for performing in-network processing is autonomic computing. And you can also rely on middleware that provides services for users. So I'll just skip this part of the autonomic computing that uh, allows you to perform this part. 
So uh, the point here is that raw data can be combined and processed to gain new knowledge insights. This is clear. Uh, there are lots of uh, opportunities and open problems in this area that we are far from solving them. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Um, not really a question, just a comment um, regarding your uh, slide about how to approach all of that. Um, there is a whole field of research that actually looks at the theories underlying processing in sensor networks already. I think they call it this usually distributed um, uh, wireless um, computing um, or ambient intelligence as well. So I, I know I was associated with a group in, in Melbourne uh, that looked at actually spatial algorithms, usually detection of regions and, and so on, in a decentralized manner. So one of the things you can do is then not send raw data to the hub, which takes a lot of energy and a lot of computation, but actually send uh, process results in, in the network and then decide whether you send them back to the hub or not. Yeah. Uh, you are response. right. There are lots of examples like that. And uh, I guess the real challenge is how to design this in a consistent way, not in an ad hoc way, because uh, what we're doing so far is just design ad hoc solutions for this kind of problem. So the real challenge is, okay, we need, the, as I mentioned, the, the theory that you lead techniques and methodology and tools so that people can apply this in a consistent way. Yeah. Yeah. How do they do for night darkness? Okay. Just, just a quick comment, and I think that to me sometimes, as a, as a person that has to deal with putting this in the ground and working with them, sometimes I find that there is a big dissociation between what computer scientists do in their labs and when, when we have to go and put everything in the field. And to find out in many cases, a lot of the stuff that we deployed and we get from you guys doesn't work like it should be working. And when I, I'm going to give you one example that probably you are missing is, for example, the clear understanding of the ecosystem where you are going to be deploying that wireless sensing network and how this can affect communication is a big picture right there of oh, yeah. a tree. And yeah. you know, you wanna have a sensor that you have that kind of tree. Mm -hmm. So right now that one of the things that we are trying to understand is how can we bring issues like LiDAR systems, ground based LiDAR systems and airborne LiDAR systems to actually understand the structure of the forest where this is going to be deployed. Mm -hmm. And actually we can actually go back to you guys with the information and you guys can do better design of your networks. Because at the end of the day, when we go and we deploy the things in the dry season, like in Mataseca, everybody communicates. It rains, the leaves goes on, and nobody communicates. Yeah. So this is one of the things that we need to uh, This is much broader than just computer science. So you just said mentioned a problem from electrical engineering, basic uh, fundamental right. communication there. So yeah, you are right. We have lots of uh, work to do. We have to combine different results from different areas. Uh, it's a challenge. One last question. So just a quick question. Um, what sort of tags are you using for the animal tracking? Are you using acoustic tags? Are you using accelerometers? Or are you using video or audio? Well, depending on the application, there are all sorts of these tags that are, are being used. But the data processing is very different depending oh, on the oh yes, tag. Yes, yes. Mm. Uh, what I'm saying is that depending on the kind of application you have, uh, I know of applications that use like uh, colors, just uh, an RFID. So it depends mm. on the kind of application people have. Okay, but you're not deploying any particular types yourselves? No. Uh, I, I have an experiment with frogs, not with animals. So okay. If yeah. you're interested, we're doing work with crocodiles, tracking crocodiles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so we, do, we really do have to move on. Um, thank you again. Thank you. So our next presentation is about um, digital urban informatics. That it's one of the um, probably most successful uh, environmental informatics framework. Um, adoption we've been going on for the past two years. 
Dr. Yong Liu has, uh, in this project, integrated uh, uh, multiple Microsoft technologies into it, starting from old data, Azure, and you, in the old times, we also integrated uh, workflow technologies from Microsoft as well. So uh, he's going to cover several use scenarios in this presentation. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Yong Liu. Uh, I'm from uh, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. So I'll start with uh, just an outline. So uh, I'll talk about the scientific motivation and background and our objectives. And I'll present the four case studies. Um, they are all actually related. Uh, so the first one is the data interoperability and integration in integrated water resource management decision support. And we primarily uh, develop some methodologies for, 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 for usage uh, in, in many other projects, actually. Second one is the geospatial visual analytics uh, for flooding control. And third one is the mobile plus cloud for citizen science in emergency management. Uh, I actually gave a talk uh, in details for that part, but uh, today I, I'll just show a, a, a brief uh, summary. And then fourth one is groundwater sustainability and drought risk analysis, and finally conclusion. So, so the project name was uh, named as uh, Digital Urban Informatics, uh, but uh, the actual motivation is because of uh, the well-known uh, continuing uh, urbanization and the regional climate change. Uh, so because of those, uh, there will be uh, increase, uh, increasingly uh, the, the, the new uh, uh, extreme hydrological events such as storms and drought in the coming decades. And there are two primary uh, problem, uh, problems. Uh, one is a near real-time problem uh, that's mostly related to flooding control and emergency management. So the usual question people are uh, uh, worrying about uh, is uh, what, 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 what's the water level in, in, in the canal in the next hour, for example. Uh, and that requires very uh, fast uh, response uh, turnaround time uh, uh, to make decisions. Uh, in terms of like uh, open control gates and other things. The, s the second category of problems uh, is long, uh, relative long term, uh, about water sustainability and, and decision support again. Uh, so for example, long term drought risk reduction. And the usual question people ask is how much water is available in the next 50 or 100 years given current pumping and recharge rates in a particular region. Uh, when groundwater was the only uh, or the, 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 the major uh, provider of the fresh water. So it's just to give you an, 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 an concrete view, what's the current situation of uh, the drought uh, condition in the U.S.? This was uh, actually released daily by NOAA. Uh, and as, as you can see, uh, on the uh, south side, like Arizona, Texas, uh, have been uh, experienced a very severe drought condition this year. Uh, but actually, this 2001 also experienced a very severe flooding as well. So like the 2011 uh, Mississippi flooding uh, in May, uh, the, the, the flood crest actually was detected uh, as the second highest rise in re uh, recent history uh, since 1937. Uh, so the cost of flooding for that single uh, event uh, will be over... Uh, one billion dollar. So, so the challenges for, for digital urban informatics actually uh, is very, uh, uh, I would say it's very actually uh, generic. Uh, so, so there are two, two kinds of uh, challenges. One is the, about data, the other one is the model. And for the data part, uh, I think people talk about a lot, uh, but uh, mostly uh, what we uh, are interested in is the heterogeneity. Uh, how do we overcome heterogeneity? Uh, because heterogeneous data uh, in the environment, uh, as well as like a social web, like a Twitter, uh, basically are the major barrier for us to develop uh, data-intensive participatory science, uh, not just the sheer volume uh, of data. The second uh, challenge is model, uh, and that could be a data-driven model, like statistic or machine learning model. Uh, or physics-based model, uh, and, and here I, I mainly talk about the physics-based model. 
So people still want to use an increasingly higher resolution and a computational intensive physics experiment model uh, to provide predictive uh, understanding for the uh, natural environment. Uh, that's still true in many hydrological uh, study. And our digital urban informatics project aims to develop a new uh, computational framework that can harmonize both data intensive computing and physics modeling approach for science-based sustainable environment and water resource management. And there are uh, issues related to data versus uh, the in interoperability uh, between data and interoperability between models and interoperability between data and model. So, so specifically, I, uh, we uh, identify three objectives. Uh, first one is the interoperability and the integration issue. Uh, how, how to integrate data from a heterogeneous sensor web uh, that's commonly seen in integrated water resource management and environment decision support. And when you actually do integrated water resource management, you not only just need data from hydrological uh, sensor uh, web, but also other uh, categories of data. And then second one is the geospatial visual analytics. Because the overall thing uh, we, are, we care about is for decision support. So how do we provide advanced visual analytics for multiple data, including citizen uh, provided data in a spatial temporal framework? Uh, and then the third one, the event-driven computation. Uh, because many of the decision support uh, requires quick turnaround time. And how, how do we actually enable on-demand execution of large ensemble runs of simulation models uh, in areas such as groundwater risk analysis, uh, river flow, and volume during flooding or job uh, seasons? So, so put it in a, in a pictorial uh, view, basically uh, uh, we have three objectives and then we have a case studies actually uh, cover several uh, Actually, there are overlaps between uh, different case studies uh, that actually touch on uh, different objectives. But overall, the goal is that uh, we, we can actually uh, advance uh, those uh, uh, water resources management uh, problems. So the first one uh, I want to talk about is uh, data integration issue in integrated water resource management and decision support. So uh, as we all know that there are several uh, standardization efforts uh, in this area, uh, but, the in, but in reality, what we have right now is still a heterogeneous sensor web. So we, we, need, we can use uh, quasi HIS uh, to get some uh, water ML data, but then when we actually want the uh, event data from NOAA website, they, they are basically in uh, uh, just plain CSV file. And USGS actually published like a, a shapefile and other uh, kinds of uh, 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 geospatial data. And then there are also like a, a, a open government data initiative provides uh, old data and, and other kind of uh, format. And then we have our own local uh, uh, sensor network uh, in Illinois that we are interested in. So, so the so the goal is that actually we want to transform this kind of uh, heterogeneous sensor web to a linked sensor web, uh, or linked data, so that we can have uh, uh, a data hub that support a particular region of interest study. So the, so the challenge that we have uh, for building a linked sensor web is how we can actually republish those existing plain data to semantically link the data and how we can uh, link those potentially linkable data together and then enable complex queries uh, in a heterogeneous sense of web. Uh, and how do we actually serve data in an, in an open geospatial uh, RESTful service, kind of sensor observation service like uh, interface? And because that's uh, uh, some, something that uh, in, in the standardization community, uh, people want to actually uh, use that, but we can whether we can provide them uh, in, a, in a usable way, that's still uh, uh, not a question, uh, a challenge. And how we actually been tracking the provenance of linked data to facilitate uh, uh, trust and validation. So because we, we need integrated uh, multiple data sources from multiple government agencies or uh, local uh, sensor network, uh, we need to verify that. Uh, so, so we actually are, uh, 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 
did some uh, uh, exercise and, and actually provide uh, some solutions to all this, uh, including uh, reuse multiple uh, ontologies, uh, leverage geometric analysis to uh, discover links between uh, spatial data entities, data entities and the providing uh, linked data API uh, so that it actually serve uh, sensor observation service like uh, a service and then use the open provenance model to uh, annotate, uh, check the provenance. And, and, and our goal is to, to move towards a linked sensor web because we are not just interested in uh, geospatial data or just time series data or just some tweets. We are interested in uh, those uh, collectively, uh, a data hub basically, uh, some people talk about. Uh, so so it's, it's a pay as you go kind of a data integration effort because we cannot just integrate everything we want, uh, but for a particular project, for a particular region of interest, uh, we can do that uh, by uh, basically uh, follow the solution uh, we propose. So in the end, what you get is something like you just uh, have some, some links that you can click and then uh, you can go from uh, state to Illinois to uh, sensors in Illinois and then the data stream is actually provided uh, by the sensors. So I actually want to show you uh, the, the actual, um, let me see, uh, the actual site that looks, where, where is it looks at? Yeah, yeah so, so okay, so, so this is the, the pay-as-you-go kind of a data hub uh, linked uh, sense website. So if you just click uh, all observations, uh, it basically shows up uh, uh, the data records that we integrated. And the interesting thing is that it actually has all kinds of uh, links that are embedded uh, there. And so, so basically this is uh, uh, some uh, hair observation event data. Uh, and then actually you can see it, it was derived from uh, NOAA's uh, uh, original data. And that if you click that, you can actually get the original source. And it actually intersects with uh, this uh, um, county, and this this is basically the geospatial uh, coordinates it has, and this data actually was derived uh, from the uh, USGS uh, National Atlas uh, data. So, and if you if you are uh, concerned about the definition of hail, uh, you can basically click that and then it, sh it shows uh, the actual hour definition by the sweet uh, ontology provided by NASA. So uh, that's basically uh, something that we, we, we would like to have uh, uh, in the end, but at, at this moment I think what we have achieved is that we, we can do, uh, 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 actually establish a, a data hub for a particular region of interest uh, relatively uh, uh, reasonably, uh, so that's that first thing, uh, and also you can do visualization uh, as well uh, by just querying the data. Uh, but I want to talk about that visualization part in the second case study. So, so the second case study is uh, about the geospatial visual analysis for flooding control, and the region uh, or the, the the partner collaboration uh, collaborator. Uh, uh, from uh, the South Florida Water Management District. And they have uh, experienced uh, many uh, hurricane seasons, of course. So, so the particular case that we, are, uh, we, we have worked on is the Hurricane Ernstone in 2006. Uh, so we, we have all kinds of uh, different data that we, we collect. So this is basically the daily uh, overland water depth data uh, in color. Uh, that's the, and that's produced by the model. So this is the model output. And this is the water level in the canal. Uh, those uh, lines uh, is also provided by the model. And this is the observation data because your observation data usually is just sparse. You, you only have sensors in, in particular locations. And then you also have citizen coin data. Those are, those are all actual uh, real data. And basically during the events, uh, people actually call in. And there are different types of data. Uh, 
uh, a different type of events uh, people report it. So, so in the end, we have both uh, model data, geospatial uh, data, like those uh, canal uh, uh, and wires, and citizen coin data, and uh, now actually uh, uh, satellite image data, et cetera. So we integrate them, and then we show uh, using the uh, WWT Earth as a demo kind of uh, example here. Yeah, so here. So this is about one week data that we integrate and uh, put it together. So this basically shows the path of the Hurricane Ernesto in 2006 using the NOAA image uh, data. And then we zoom in into actually South Florida, uh, the, the big basin, uh, big Cypress basin, uh, the area of interest. And there are uh, model-based uh, output data in the background, uh, shows the uh, uh, water level, and then there are canal, water level, and then the citizen sensing data. So you can see while the, the hurricane passed by, uh, you can see how people actually report events. You can see those red bubbles showing up uh, once the, uh, once, uh, if you look at it in 3D, it's much better uh, to look at it uh, this way. So those, those uh, columns shows the water level in, in the canal. Those are observation data. Uh, this is the big Cypress Basin. Uh, yeah, this, this is the area of interest. Uh, so you can see how those uh, citizen reports pop up after the, the pass of the, the hurricane. Okay, so that's basically one uh, exercise of uh, using using this platform. Uh, yeah, yeah. You you use use word wide telescope. Uh, where is the? It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> And where's the oh, oh, the tab? Okay, that that works. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so the third one, actually, I, I already gave a presentation on Monday, uh, but I just want to briefly mention it. Uh, so, so as I mentioned in, in, in the previous uh, use case, citizen actually uh, actively participates uh, in all kinds of this kind of uh, emergency situation. So, but they use like a landline to call in and then there's no... Uh, no easy way to integrate uh, with the uh, agency-owned data, and there's very limited uh, uh, participation because they don't get feedback immediately, and then they, uh, there's no personalized, localized spatial temporal animation tool. Uh, so, so we basically uh, design and implement a mobile plus cloud system called Mapster, and this actually uh, got the Microsoft Research Award uh, in, in the summer of uh, uh, this summer during the faculty summit. So I'll just show you quickly the demo uh, because some of you may not have, have seen this before. So basically use a uh, tweet and uh, post to the Twitter and then uh, we have our streaming data fetcher and providing service and then the s s smartphone user interface can actually use it. Uh,
that's just our project website. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need, I need to okay. yeah. That's the only way to yeah. to exit. Okay. All right. So yeah, I just skip those slides. Yeah, this just uh, shows some uh, features. The fourth case study actually is related to the the drought analysis. Uh, like groundwater sustainability and drought risk analysis. Uh, in that uh, kind of uh, scenario, uh, oftentimes very complex ensemble runs are needed to quantify uncertainties associated with predictive groundwater has and flows. And usually what, uh, what people want is uh, use multiple models because uh, as we all know, models are always wrong. So. Uh, People use uh, so-called alternative conceptual models. Uh, those are all physics-based models. So you, 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 uh, you may have uh, five, six models to, to model the same region, and then use a stream flow stochastic model uh, to uh, evaluate different groundwater pumping uh, scenario. The stream, the stream flow uh, stochastic model basically provides the input uh, to the, mo to the uh, uh, alternative conceptual models. So. So uh, what, what, what the challenge is that uh, usually those kind of uh, uh, simulation uh, needs uh, quick turnaround time uh, because uh, when, when people actually run this, uh, usually they, need, they, they gather the stakeholders together in the decision room and they want to show how this scenario change and then run the uh, analysis and then show the uh, actual uh, uh, probability distribution of different scenarios. So, so we, we develop a, a model flow on Azure system to support this. Uh, and we have a collaborator from uh, Arizona Department of Water Resources. They have probably the best groundwater data system uh, in the United States, uh, they gathered uh, groundwater data very diligently, and they have uh, modeled this region very uh, well. Uh, and the case that uh, we uh, we use is uh, actually uh, multiple models, uh, including model flow, which is a USGS uh, groundwater simulation uh, uh, model, and then zone budget and then hydro uh, format all uh, from USGS to quantify uncertainties associated with Predict, predictive groundwater has and flows. So uh, there are six alternative conception models were used, and then a, plus a stream flow stochastic model, and that basically produced a 100 independent 100 year stream flow realization to evaluate the different groundwater uh, scenarios. Uh, and then that basically tries to quantify the uncertainty or the, the scenario like. Uh, in given the current pumping rates for different models with different input, what's, what would be the groundwater head at the water level in 100 years? And is, is, do we still have enough groundwater supply uh, for Arizona? So the sequential runs takes like eight hours uh, to complete this analysis. Uh, and of course, uh, people want easy to use on demand kind of uh, uh, execution. So we actually use uh, Azure to develop a parallel ensemble computing uh, uh, model, model flow on Azure uh, system. Uh, we use Azure workflow to implement the master work of parallelization. Uh, and then we leverage Azure's data storage service, including uh, uh, blob storage for, for, mod for model itself and input output files, table storage for for individual job status and queue storage for uh, basically uh, implementing uh, messages. And the most interesting uh, feature we integrated is uh, we integrated Dropbox with Azure so that uh, people can continue basically use their desktop uh, model modeling tools uh, because usually uh, in this community uh, there are 
uh, graphical user interface based model in order to set up this model is a very complex process so they, they, they can keep use that and then once they set up the models they can just uh, zip the input files and then the models and then just drag and drop into the job box and then our system basically take care of the uh, uh, parallel execution so so this basically shows how you can run this uh, uh, ensembles so the first step, drop the zip files with, which contains model executables, input files, and the batch shell script to define a workflow on uh, how to run one realization. Uh, and then the second step, you can just find your output in your local desktop. It's done once, once the execution is done. So, so this, uh, uh, we find that actually uh, is extremely appealing to, to the community because uh, they can actually uh, uh, leverage the Azure cloud resources without actually going to a, 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 a portal or so-called science gateway and then log in to uh, uh, something and then upload some files and then uh, wait until something happen and then download from the website. Uh, so again, uh, this is not a uh, just for the Arizona use case, uh, it's actually a very generic uh, scientific modeling service on Azure. Uh, so you can actually uh, execute any any kind of uh, uh, scientific model uh, as long as you you, you can uh, define the workflow uh, well. So I hope uh, my <laughs> quick <laughs> uh, presentation give you some ideas on on how we actually uh, uh, deal with the challenges uh, within the digital urban informatics areas. Uh, so we actually, uh, uh, at least we, we think we have advanced in several areas, in, including improving data interoperability, uh, using a linked sensor web approach, uh, and also providing powerful geospatial temporal visualization uh, that basically use uh, uh, WWT Earth. And then we also develop uh, Mapster, which is the uh, mobile plus cloud system to improve the uh, emergency management, the citizen participation, and the situation awareness. And finally, uh, we support multi-model large-scale ensemble runs of complex models for on-demand ground work sustainability and drought risk analysis using model flow on Azure. So I think uh, in order to advance these areas, uh, what we need to focus on uh, is to strengthen and formalize uh, the research partnership with both our industry and academic and government agency collaborators for real world test best research development and deployment. Uh, and we actually found many uh, uh, research groups and, and agencies are, are very interested in this. Uh, and for example, like uh, Texas, uh, they, they are interested uh, interesting use like uh, something like a model flow on as well for example for, for running their analysis because of the drought uh, situation right now so uh, uh, I would like to thank uh, our sponsor and uh, our team and the collaborators and if you have any uh, question just let me know thank you thank you yeah one quick question, then we can move the conversation mm -hmm. to the coffee. Okay. Yeah, as a, as a, just a quick question. If I want to, I need to say is uh, how if you are asked to prepare the d to design the system for Tohoku earthquake and tsunami and station blackout of the nuclear reactor, such kind of thing, what is most important in your approach? For tsunami? Tsunami or other mixture of natural disasters and human-made disasters. Right, right. Tsunami, I, I'm not very familiar with that area uh, because it's basically more a uh, coastal um, engineer. Uh, yeah, so yeah. We, need, we need to gather requirements yeah, more yeah. carefully. Yeah, the one lesson we have learned seriously mm. is how to write out the remedy after it happens. In case of bread train, mm -hmm. it is within a few seconds, 18 trains were stopped by catching, by s sensing the uh, vibration of the earth, 
mm. by, uh, by using the difference of T wave and S wave velocity. Mm -hmm. And uh, within a few seconds, the reactor was stopped. And some in some reactors, all the scenarios are written. And in some uh, power station, the scenario is not perfect, and there is a delay. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on the time constant, mm -hmm. all the procedures are to be carefully redesigned. And uh, you should prepare some uh, uh, contingencies. You should be ready mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can come in, on, on, on in a general principle way. So we have been uh, working on case-based reasoning uh, on this kind of post-disaster uh, uh, like response. So you can basically have uh, some historical uh, events to basically say what you should respond in terms of what kind of uh, disaster. And then you can mutate those things uh, using case-based reasoning. Uh, but but the, for tsunami is, is so so basically what what we have solved is only like 20 maybe less than 20 percent of the whole problems <laughs> but but i think uh we all understand the challenges and 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 we probably take uh, another decade to solve the uh, or to actually approach and solve some of the major challenges yeah so uh, thanks again uh, no uh, problem. very good yes. and so this concludes our open data for open science session and thank